Love staying informed? Subscribe now and get unlimited access to local news, weather, and sports for just 99 cents a month for your first three months at inform.news join. Read every story, listen to every podcast, and download the apps that keep you informed and on the go 24 hours a day. So head to inform.news slash join right now to subscribe. What are you waiting for? Get three months of local news for just 99 cents a month at inform.news slash join. Welcome to Plain Talk, and I hope you had a wonderful 4th of July holiday. Uh, I know I certainly did. Enjoyed the fireworks display here in Minot, which it seems to get better every year. It's a really good one this year. Um, a little bit later in the show, joined as always as I am by my Wednesday co-host, Ben Hansen. We're going to talk about um, a recent column I wrote. It's about uh, honoring public service. Because um, I, I was thinking, like, on, on the patriotic holidays, like, Fourth of July, obviously Memorial Day. We we spend a lot of time Veterans Day. We spend a lot of time honoring the military, honoring first responders, and rightfully so. Not taking a single thing away from that. I worry though that we forget that at the heart, the beating heart of our democracy is public service. Ultimately, the military, the law enforcement, everybody else, they report to civilian authority. They report to people who are elected on the ballot, and yet Americans have a very low opinion of politicians and. I don't know. I, I think there's some room to rethink that, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. To start off with, we're going to be talking about the ongoing, as you remember, we talked about it endlessly during the legislative session. There were um, bills. I called them book ban bills. Obviously, the proponents of the bills don't feel like that's accurate, but um, there were two bills. One was House Bill 1205. That one passed, and I would argue was was the le- the less stringent of the two. Um, the other one was Senate Bill 2360. It did pass the legislature, but Governor Burgum vetoed it. And then um, the the Senate voted to override the veto, but the o- veto override failed narrowly in the North Dakota House. Um, mm-hmm. That one failed. But here to talk about all that, because right now there is House Bill 1205. It is the law. And our state's librarians are obligated to uh, obliged to, to figure out how they're going to comply with that law. So here to talk with me mm-hmm. about it is... Carrie Ann Betcher. She is the president of the North Dakota Library Association. Um, and she also uh, is heads up the uh, right here in my hometown, the Ward County Public Library. Carrie Ann, how are you? Good. How are you? Doing good. Um, let's let's talk about this first, because one of the things that really bothered me and I'm I'm, I'm very open minded when it comes to debate. We live in a democracy. Mm-hmm. Debate is important. And I, I don't have a problem with debating, debating controversial ideas. Um, somebody puts an idea on, on the table. I don't, it's, it's, I, I don't want to make it sound like, Oh, you know, we should, we should be drawing a, a building a fence around the democratic process and only certain ideas are allowed to be debated. I don't believe in that. But one of the things that, that depressed me during the legislative session was the tenor of the debate around the two bills where I had people talking about, you know, librarians and educators and they're groomers and they want to show children pornography. And I, I mean, I was accused of that as an opponent of these bills. It's like, oh, you just want to show kids you're pro pornography. You want to show kids pornography. And I, well, what was it like as a librarian serving your community going through that debate? You know, we recognize there's people who's very passionate on both sides and that's completely and totally awesome. It was very hard to not take a lot of it personally. You know, like you had people going, well, I don't mean you in particular. Okay, but you just told me that I was. So how am I not supposed to take that personally? Yeah. Just kind of. I Can I, I mean, can I kind of be a jerk and say, what were were some of the worst of the things that you heard? Because I, and I feel bad asking that to badger you, but if you're willing to disclose that, I think it is worth people who are only, maybe casually reading the headlines, wondering mm-hmm. what's going on. Um, I know that this got very ugly, though, in a way that I don't necessarily mm-hmm. think was reported terribly pub- publicly, or, or, or maybe just folks don't know. What were some of the worst of it? Because I know you uh, got quite a bit of yes. flack that I thought was extremely undeserving. That we were pushing porn, that we were grooming, um, that we hated children. That was one of my personal favorites. 
um, that we wanted only drag queens to do our story times that we, I mean. And, and you've, I assume, have had story times for children for, I assume, decades there at the... Yep, so um, as long as, so I've been at the Ward County Library since 2012, and we've had story times since then. So that's that's a little more than a decade. I You know, one interesting thing, because we had uh, your colleague from the Minot Public Library, who was also... Uh, a uh, uh, obviously was 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 an advocate on on these issues, mm -hmm. and and she was saying like I think she's been there seven eight nine years I'm forgetting, and she said during that time there's a very small number of challenges, like oh, yeah. like four or five. And you're you've been there now over a decade if it's since 2012. Mm -hmm. What um how many challenges of books have you seen successful or not? For Ward County, obviously I can't I don't know the numbers sure. off the top of my head for the entire state but for ward county we have had two that have successfully completed the entire process of actually filling out the paperwork to submit a challenge for a book and an and, item. and of those two how many how many were the, were the was the book successfully challenged like removed or i guess moved within the library collection neither of them actually neither of them so i i don't know i mean even even just the fact that two I have to assume it's not a very arduous process. I mean, it's filling out a form or something. Yeah. Getting it's to just... a form. Um, for us, I have, I think it's a week to make a decision um, based off of our collection development policy. I respond to the patron and then they have three weeks, I believe, to contact me if they choose to appeal my decision to our library board. And then they can go before the library board for an appeal process and the library board makes the final decision if they appeal it. Two, two of those instances in a decade in a library that serves, it, it, that exists in, in one of our state's most popular, I mean, I realize Minot's not a big city by, by, by the standards of just about any other state, but it's one of the largest yep. communities in our state, and there's mm -hmm. been two in the last yep. decade plus. Yep. That and, doesn't speak to a, a problem to me. And when you're getting these negative, you know, emails or messages that one of the more, you know, the more personal ones you're talking about, are, mm -hmm. do you feel or did you have conversations with folks who are expressing those views about this process? Were they aware that there was already a process in place? Um, a lot of them not, weren't necessarily aware, so we did let them know. Uh, I know mine at public for sure and a couple of libraries across the state actually had events where they invited the public to come in and they talked about their process from when they start to look at the book to order it to what they all go through for how they catalog a book and how you choose where the book goes in the library. Now let's, let's talk about the bills that, that pass. And, and again, house bill 1205, mm -hmm. that is the bill. It was signed by governor Burgum and it was introduced by the house majority leader, Mike LaFour. What yep. was remarkable to me and, and Ben can speak about how unusual this is, is that you have a bill backed by a legislative leader that has passed and then you have a legislative leader basically on the floor advocating for the passage of a nearly duplicate bill at least duplicate in intent far more draconian in its um i guess in the consequences it would have implemented but the legislature tried to pass not just one bill but two bills i mean that was mm -hmm. very remarkable to me as, as a longtime legislative observer that i mean you had the majority leader all i mean usually if the majority leader puts in a bill the duplicate bills get get folded into the majority leader's bill that's kind of their prerogative that's kind of how it works it didn't in this time i mean they, they were trying to pass duplicate bills that spoke to me that they were really trying to satisfy not so much a public policy need but a political need where you just had a lot of people clamoring for this and they just wanted to see something happen without a lot of consideration for what that something was. And actually, it started out as three. There was a Senate bill that got rolled into Senate Bill 2360. Okay, I missed that one. That, yep. All right, that must have happened early in the process. Um, yep, that was and Carrie Ann, end you, you, of January-ish. And do you typically represent the Library Association during the legislative session? So this been... was my first time. Um, I was elected... <sighs> last year as president so then as president i got to be the one that got to go down and testify which was a very interesting experience so, so this is an interesting aspect that i don't uh, might not be commonly thought of by maybe mm -hmm. some of our listeners or folks at home when you're involved in any kind of public entity 
-hmm. and the legislature can debate it, talk about it. Now we're talking about the controversial one, of course, because that's what's getting headlines. But anybody under the sun, you know, the North Dakota Dentist Association, when they have rules about who can and can't go to dentist school that their association can't set, has to go to usually the Industry Business and Labor Committee, talk to mm -hmm. them about uh, you know, advocating for those rules. Did you, um, as a for instance, did you come in with any kind of set agenda or things you were trying to pass for the Library Association when you became the president? No, not really. Uh I was and, actually hoping for a calm legislative session. Mm -hmm. And did you have any access to like some kind of professional resources? And maybe if not that, uh, past presidents with experience or any kind of lobbyists on the behalf of your association in the legislature? Um, so we talked a lot about um, with oh, the ACLU. We talked a lot with them. Um, thankfully, this North Dakota State Librarian has gone through quite a few legislative sessions so she was there for yes, yes. um she was there for a lot of advice too and that's i guess there was one bill that we kind of wanted passed they did pass one that removes maintenance of effort for state aid to libraries well let's let's so, talk about but, let's talk about the two book ban bills that passed mm -hmm. and and so 1205 is the one that's the law now yep. and wh what does that mean for our libraries what, what do they have to do now good question so the way they wrote it by january 1st of next year 2024 we have to have a policy and a procedure in place that says we review the collections to meet the law so to meet that we aren't having pornographic books in the children's selection it has to include a process for the removal or relocation so if it's in the children's section if we don't want to remove it we have to have a process to relocate it to the adult section. Um, a collection, the process for a development of a collection that is appropriate for both age and maturity levels and that's suitable for the purpose of a library. And then a process for us to receive, evaluate, and respond to a request to challenge the materials. And the process to periodically review the library collection and then by May 1st of 2024, we have to submit a report to legislative management that we did all of those things. And then is that an annual report? I mean, are you, are you required to make like like regular reports now to the legislature? That I'm not entirely positive. And that's actually something we have one librarian submitting a question to legislative management to check on that because we're all like, do we have to do this annually? Is it just a one time thing? What all do we have to do? Um, then we're also seeking clarification from the attorney general on what a couple of things mean because it says children's section but we have small libraries that are just one room so their children's section and adult section kind of flow together so does that mean they have to remove it completely or as long as they have designated shelves does that mean that's their only yeah. children's section do you feel like um I, I, so, and, and to be clear, for, from the law, the, the, the definition now of explicit sexual material is, and I'm quoting here, any material which, taken as a whole, appeals to the pr prurient interests of minors is patently offensive to prevailing standards in the adult community in North Dakota as a whole with respect to what is suitable material for minors and taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value to minors. And I got to tell mm -hmm. you, somebody who works with words for a living, um, that boy, I, I, I read that and my conclusions about what meets that definition are going to vary differently, even from yep. maybe the people on this phone call. Um, yep. So I, what they did, they added the Miller test, which is a federal right. test to determine stuff to the bill to right. make it so it wasn't a huge long list that everything started with. How do you feel like that's going to be with to comply as a librarian? Is this workable? It's workable. It's That's part of our other question of they reworded the Miller test a little bit. So is it still the Miller test or is it a new Miller test? What are we doing here? Did you have to go in and testify? for or against these, I'm assuming you're probably on the con side of these bills. Did you have to be present at the state legislature on a regular basis this last legislative session? Um, so I attempted to be, it didn't always work out that I could be there physically in person. Mm -hmm. um, there was a couple of them just with my everyday job that I had to do testifying online, which is actually a 
really nice thing that the legislative has available now. And a very new one yeah. that they were drugged to, kicking and screaming during COVID. That's my commentary, not yours. I don't want to get you in trouble. I, I mean, I would just like to say I do appreciate to have the opportunity to do it. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's, no. I, I'm saying that there are many legislators there that were extremely hesitant of allowing people into their little club mm -hmm. during the months of yeah. January through April every other year. In yeah. Mark. And I, I, in Burley County, you were not to be heard. I think it was uh, I think it was more also uh, people like me watching. Uh, <laughs> they do which they didn't uh, necessarily want. Did, did, did were you before these uh, those two bills? Did the bill sponsors reach out to you or the library association when crafting these bills during no. the process of submitting them? No, not no. at all. No. Did you, did you, uh, were you ever afforded the opportunity to ask why? Personally, I was not. And when down uh, there testifying you, you, no. with them, emotions were running a little high. So I didn't necessarily trust myself to ask them. That makes sense. Now, Carrie Ann, you don't say anything. I just say this. Now, if you were, you know, a larger business and you had contributed a lot of money to the right PACs, it would have been very offensive that those prime sponsors had not spoken to you and delicately tiptoed around you whilst forming this legislation. But since you're a volunteer uh, president, you know, whatever, mm. not not time to listen to you. Now, I, you don't say anything. Carrie -Anne. I, I, say I, I found it convincing as, as a North Dakota citizen the idea that we're that, that we're attacking fine public servants and, and not just librarians, but teachers, you know, people mm -hmm. who, who run like school libraries and, and the like that we're attacking them as groomers that we're assuming that there's pornography in our school libraries, which I'm sorry. I mean, I've spent a lot of time in our libraries, including the children's section. I have kids. I never saw any pornography there. Um, so I, I mean, I, 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 that offended me that it was, it was, we were passing laws or debating laws based on just a completely fabricated premise to begin with. Um, and if, if enemy is a conservative too, that we have a process in place. I understand that, that the public has an interest in curating the content of our libraries. We don't have hustler magazine available in the library for good reason. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. I, my problem is we had an existing process, but we had to go preempt it. And I, I, this is a roundabout way of getting my question. What are the consequences? Like if, if your library, Carrie Ann, if the Ward County Public Library mm -hmm. fails to comply with this law, like you don't file the report with the legislature, what happens? Mm -hmm. or, or if you do file the report, you say, yeah, we did all these things and, and we, got rid, we got rid of all the scary books or, or what, I guess whatever happens. And then someone comes along and says, aha, you know, there's still a book here that offends me. Is there a consequence for you as a librarian? That that's one of my questions that I'm hoping to get clarified because I 2360 had a consequence. 1205 doesn't necessarily have a consequence. So who knows? Could have a what, consequence, could not. Which again, I'm being a poor interviewer. I'm being more of a can uh, a commentator than an interviewer. And I apologize to you, Carrie Ann, for that. But oh. that's not how laws are supposed to work. You can't just say, and you can't run a red light. What happens if you do? Eh. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I think the problem is, is they, they could potentially run into some real problems if they did put teeth in it. Um, it's, it's, sure. it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a very cynical thing to say, but I think it's true that they didn't put teeth in the law because it was more likely to get challenged that way. Mm -hmm. And it makes defending it in a court of law a lot more complicated. If now suddenly we're talking about putting a librarian or a teacher in jail or fining them or taking some sort of adverse action against them. Now, I mean, you've opened up a whole new realm of jurisprudence that, that it has to pass muster mm -hmm. by than what they've done, which, which cynically, by the way, speaks to how unserious they were. Right now, now yeah. again, I'm I'm saying this as somebody. I didn't want either of these bills to pass. I don't think we had a problem. I think they're offensive. But if they had the courage of their convictions, they would have put some consequences on this, and they didn't. It's a cop out. So, and so, Kirian, can I ask you? And it is a steering question, but I'll be explicit about what I'm trying to get at. Do you regret like running or becoming the president of this association in a volunteer <laughs> kind of capacity? And no, but but I mean that though. You weren't yeah. expecting this, I assume. Do you regret no. having to have done this? No? Okay. Yeah. I, well, no. I, I appreciate that because I, you know, and you can tell where I'm going with this too. I am a former legislator, but I'm also someone who's been on 
in a volunteer capacity on business mm -hmm. boards. I've been on, I've been part of the local home builders board. I've been part of the, um, the Fargo Moorhead realtors board and the statewide policy board. And there are times where you get people, frankly, nipping at your heels association in this case, in that case, like association members who might say, why did you guys do this? I can't believe we have to have uh, double the amount of continuing education hours now. And then you look mm -hmm. at the details and it's like, okay, instead of 10 hours, you have 20 hours and it has been updated since 1978. Calm down. And I'm, <laughs> I'm wondering, I just, it, it bothers me when someone's in not only an elected official capacity, but in this case with Michael Four, he's the head of the largest caucus that we have seen maybe in North Dakota state history for an individual party. And he's putting his full weight as a legislator behind it and people like you are frankly having to catch up and deal with it. You didn't wake um, up in the morning and think of this. I mean, was there any discussions about that? Or is there going to be a way of prepping like your successor for legislative sessions? I mean, I'm sad that we're to that point, but it's probably something that you're going to have to think about now, right? Well, thankfully, the person that will take over for me won't actually be president during a legislative session, mm. but the next person will. So yes. you, you do one year as president-elect, one year as president, and then one year as past president. Um, but the person, so we haven't elected the person that will be president for the next session yet, but I've been writing notes and we've been working a lot and we plan on having sessions at our annual conference about how to work with your local leaders and then how to work with legislators. And you got to be careful of how you talk sometimes when testifying. So you got to learn how to walk the fine line. Well, it's it's I mean, you've got to, this this issue I'm I'm assuming is not going to be a flash in the pan. I mean, like it or not, there's a lot of people that were passionate about this. Is there any attempt like to do outreach from the North Dakota Library Association to try? Because clearly there there are large enough factions mm -hmm. in the public that believe there was pornography in our libraries mm -hmm. that that the lawmakers felt they had to respond to it and pass pass a law uh, yeah. and almost almost pass two laws. Um is there any like outreach to try to dissuade that like like come in and look at the books come in and look at our libraries and see the association hasn't done a whole lot with that yet we've been kind of talking with individual libraries about how they can do that because sometimes it's better when it comes from the local level and not from our association and part of that is north dakota library association is an affiliate of the American Library Association and a lot of the proponents of these bills are very against the ALA. So it's going, okay, how far can we push and how far do we want to step back so that yeah. we're not affecting our local libraries? I would, I mean, do the people listen to this? I mean, I would encourage you, go to your library, look at the, mm -hmm. look at the shelves. And by the way, discover a lot of the things I was joking before we started recording. I'm going down to my local library after I'm done recording this to check out a reciprocating saw because that mm -hmm. is a service that the Minot Public Library, I don't want to have to buy a reciprocating saw to use once a year. I'm going to buy it. They offer so many services that are beyond books. Our libraries are wonderful places staffed uh, I, almost yeah. exclusively by wonderful people. So what what are we talking about? I guess is, I guess is the problem. And, and I know so many kids that came from families that were frankly, let's just to put it nicely, we're not of means that wound up getting scholarships, wound up getting other places in life and maybe succeeding in an, an economic plane that very frankly, the previous generation hadn't. And a big part of that was accessing. Now, a lot of it can be done online, but not all of it. There was a lot of time they spent in public libraries accessing books, knowledge and collect, you know, just collections that they otherwise would not have had access to because their family couldn't afford to buy all that or they didn't know maybe what they were into and they're having a plethora of topics to choose from. I mean, we have these awesome resources that, to Rob's point, I don't know if folks know about. Interlibrary loan is a little mm -hmm. miracle unto itself. There's, only, there's, you know, I've, I've checked out several books that are like, this is only available at the University of Miami, Florida, and you can get it for free. I check out eBooks but, constantly. I've checked out three eBooks in the last week. I haven't bought a book. I have an Amazon Kindle <laughs> that I read eBooks on. I haven't bought a book from Amazon in three years. So yes. it's wonderful. It's wonderful stuff. Carrie Ann, la last question. Have you guys done any math, like what, what the cost of complying with House Bill 1205? And I know there's still some open questions. Yes. Like if you're a smaller library and your adult section is in the same room as your children's mm -hmm. section, maybe they're just a couple shelves apart or something. Mm -hmm. How do you comply with it? I, I realize there's some open questions, but do you have an idea for 
like what what the cost of compliance is going to be at this point? Not with 1205. When we were figuring out costs, we were mainly concentrating on 2360 because that was the one that got the fiscal note attached to it. So we more figured out costs than 2360. We haven't really figured out the cost for 1205 yet. Okay. So they didn't attach a fiscal note to 1205? Not to 1205. 2360 had a fiscal note. Was there a reason stated that there wasn't a fiscal note attached to that bill? Not that I heard. Yeah. Okay. I'll get into rambling about that later. I had an actual question because I feel bad, Carrie Ann, because I feel like I've been more of a commentator than an interviewer here. Did you hear anywhere near the same volume of outreach from regular North Dakotans about this issue uh, before and after the session or during the session? Was there a distinct uptick in volume? of outreach to you, or has it remained steady? For my library, probably more steady. Okay. Um, I can't say across the state, but I know we did have several patrons who walked into the library in the middle of session and went, what the heck are they doing down there? And I'm like, yeah, don't know. What you're talking about, they're saying, what the heck are they doing? The legislators are doing, yep. not the librarians. Yeah. Yep. I was wondering if the... I would call it rabble rousing. Others would call it concern uh, mm -hmm. by legislators during session, increase the amount of outreach we're getting. And otherwise, to your point before, folks just didn't know there was a process in place or didn't have these suspicions. But, it, but from what you're saying, it was a steady amount of outreach during both periods of time? For my library, I can't necessarily talk for other right. libraries. I know Makes we sense. have in libraries across the state, we've seen an uptick in book challenges since legislative session. Great. Well, I guess I guess we'll see how that goes out. It's a brave new world uh, that we're living in, but I'm I'm hoping this is a fact. Until they that, ban that book too. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Uh, good I, one. I actually should look because I think Brave New World has received challenges in the past from uh, oh, across the nation. Well, well, well yeah, I know. Well, yeah, it's. I think it's cordially being read by all the youth. I think it's. I yeah. think it's one of those along with Orwell and and some of the others that uh, that people get wrapped around the axle about. Uh, carry on. Thank you so much for your time. This, uh, take yep. this, this post holiday to come talk to a couple of nerds about this stuff, but we appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. Hi there. My name is James Walner. I produce and host the podcast Dakota Spotlight, a true crime podcast that tackles historical and unsolved crimes in the upper Midwest. Follow along with me as we search for a missing girl, attempt to solve a 45-year-old murder, and much, much more. That's Dakota Spotlight Podcast, anywhere you get your podcasts, or at inform.com slash podcasts. We'll just finish up, you know, our interview with uh, Carrie Ann Betcher. She's the head of the North Dakota Library Association, also the head of the Ward County Public Library up here in Minot. Um... And it, Ben, it's so hard for me to talk about that issue because I, I just, I found, I find it outrageous that we're even talking about it. And yet there is increasingly demand for it. I mean, we, we just have, um, the North Dakota Republican party was just the new elected chairwoman of the party. Uh, Sandy Sanford is, was one of the chief proponents of these bills, the book ban bills. So I'm really struggling with the idea that we even needed it. I, I would argue that a lot of the loudest proponents of it probably haven't been inside one of our libraries in a long time or haven't spent much time inside them. Because if you have, you would I don't know think how a hysterical reaction would have happened. If, you've seen if, 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 you, if you had been there, you were an honest person and you had been in our libraries, some of these claims about us showing kids pornography in the libraries, you would you would laugh out loud. Ridiculous. It, it's it, absurd. And you were talking about being able to borrow a tool or check out a tool from the library that you don't necessarily need to own, but it's a good example of the fact that these are places that do more than just let you rent what's the newest best-selling book. The books are they wonderful. Provide, don't, I mean, don't get me wrong. The books are wonderful, but yeah. there are way more. There, These are community meeting rooms for countless associations, um, religious, veterans, other there, there are vital ways to get on the internet. If you can't afford a smartphone or a cell phone plan and you can't afford home internet, but you, I mean, in the modern world, I mean, you think how much like school, like you have kids in school, how much you have to keep up on with email, you're applying for these, jobs and everything. These are incredibly vital ways for those who yeah. have been in probably not great places in life, either in 
post recovery, some kind of a situation where they're experiencing homelessness or having just been formally incarcerated. Or even you have a applying. job and you're just you're just living on the margins. You're living paycheck and, to paycheck. And a, but so, it is a key way to apply for employment, right. aka the thing we want those people to do to right. become independent. I mean, they can uh, not only can they access entertainment for free, right? The books and the movies mm -hmm. and the music and everything that they can get. But even being able to check out something like a tool, like if you're living paycheck to paycheck and you're trying to take care of the house you're renting or the house you own or whatever, and you can't afford to buy a rake, well, you can go check one out at the library. You can get um, you can get a drill. You can get a hammer. I mean, anyway, these are wonderful places. And it's offensive to me. And, and I, I just keep getting back to it. There was, according to the proponents of these bills, there was pornography in our libraries and the children's section, no less, right? We're not talking about, we're not talking about like, like Tropic of Cancer or some, you know, yeah, pretty, or pretty, I, I pretty, pretty, or some, or some steamy romance novel. It. Or Stephen King's got racy stuff in some of right. his books. You know, They're but, saying, but authors, authors, you, you and I reckon, authors, common people, even if they haven't read the books, they recognize who George R. R. Martin is or who Stephen King is. Right. Those, I mean, we're not talking about hustler we're talking about that stuff i mean the idea that that there was porn in the children's library is is absurd anybody who's been in the library knows that that is absurd and and we're also asked to believe that somehow there was porn in the children's section but at the ward county public library there's been two challenges in more than a decade maybe and there wasn't a problem successful. and so at that point you know if you're for local control if you're for more localized government because the philosophy is people who are part of it know better what's better for themselves why wouldn't you leave it to the system that was already put right. in place which then makes if you have a problem that the bill sponsors were bringing a bad faith argument right and, and, and i and i brought this up with carry on and i i do actually i apologize to her for being such a commentator versus an interviewer but i do want to emphasize the point michael Ford is the leader of the gop majority caucus it's the, the largest caucus yeah. they've had in a very long time he put his weight behind one of these bills that I think you accurately describe as a book ban bill. We just heard from her and I've heard from others that they, the library, uh, the people who worked at these libraries were not consulted or asked about, about these bills before and not they even, put them in. And, and, and remember, Carrie Ann is the president of the North Dakota Library Association. So she's, she's not just a local librarian. She is a representative of a statewide organization that if you're going to pass a bill – about libraries, mm -hmm. you probably should have looped the organization in. Say, what do you think? Do you and, have any thoughts about this? Maybe, and, maybe by the way, we could find some common ground on this. And let's bring let's bring you into this, the person that actually has to deal with this and be subject to this law. Oh, and by the way, for even further context, there are twenty months to zero, more than a year and a half between legislative sessions. You've got more than enough time if you're planning on making this one of your bills to reach out to those people. And this reminds me. Uh, we had Representative Matt Ruby on uh, early in the session to talk about a bill he had to combine rural superintendents. And I remember asking him at the time, did you speak with a superintendent to stay in North Dakota? And he said, well, I'm hearing a lot from him right now. But he hadn't yeah. heard from them before he presented a bill. And I, I, I'm sorry to be this cranky old man who always says back in my day. But you know what? Back in my day, the whopping two sessions I was in, 2013, 2015, it was considered very poor form. And frankly, you were like kind of dismissed as someone who was unserious if you had not spoken to whatever every entity that was going to be impacted by the bills that you were passing. Sure. And it was almost voted the thing is, out even if you even if you know what period. the answer is going to be, even if you know if you're going to go to them and you know what their answer is going to be, we don't like it. We don't think it's necessary, et cetera, et cetera. You got to try if you're if you're a good public servant. You got to try, which is which is maybe a good segue into the other thing I wanted to write about. And this is proving a little my inbox has been filling up a little bit with this. My headline. This was my uh, my print column that's in papers today, Wednesday, as we record this. Uh, my headline was let's honor political service like we honor military service. And I understand a lot of people are like, oh, you want to honor politicians over veterans or whatever. And my my point was, is that we, we obviously we hold service in the military and even, even, you know, services, first responders, police, mm -hmm. fire, ambulance, we hold that, these things in very high regard. And we recognize how important they are to our society. And they are. I, I don't want to take a thing away from any of that. 
my problem is is that we tend to look down our nose at the people who serve in elected office and we like to believe very cynical things about them that they're, they're all corrupt or they're all on the take or that only rich people can get elected etc cetera, etc cetera. Well, um, they're getting rich by taking these roles right and in, in some i mean some of those complaints are not without merit we can certainly cite examples of people who have used public office to try to enrich themselves people who have have, have you know are, are just in there um in pursuit of their own goals and not necessarily serving the public i get it i understand why people feel that way on the flip side, if, if, if we assume that, if, 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 we, if we carry on as though public service is an inherently dishonorable thing, you know, Paula, all politicians are scummy or whatever, if that's the attitude, then who is it we're encouraging to seek elected office? That's what really bothers me. It, yeah, and it becomes this mythical only one person that it lends itself to strongman philosophy very quickly because it, right. it means that one person can solve all these problems, which is not what the political uh, process is supposed to be. It's supposed to be collaborative. We in North Dakota, for instance, have a weak governorship, and that's not, uh, I'm not saying Doug Burgum or any of his predecessors are weak people. The role itself is very weak. By statute and by the Constitution, our governor doesn't have the same level of executive authority that, that a governor in another state would have. By design, intentionally, because we wanted the power to remain with the people with legislative representation, which I would which I would argue on paper is a great thing. But and there's even a a further extension of this. We just got done interviewing the head of the North Dakota Library Association. And, you know, when proponents of things like these book bans come in and say, well, there's this. You know, the darker conspiracy theory side of that base says that there's an evil cabal that's threatening to steal all of our children, et cetera, et cetera. And they seem to think that people like Carry On live in ivory towers or in a mansion somewhere right. plotting these things. And these are volunteer North Dakotans who are, in her case, not getting paid to do this at all. This is a volunteer job. And she doesn't have what really offends me about legislators not reaching out to people like her before they put in these bills is she doesn't have access to lobbying resources. She doesn't have a lobbying school to go to. She's maybe never testified to the North Dakota legislature before. And because of our, in my opinion, antiquated system of every other year's session, she told us she's trying to pass this information down to the next person, but the next person is only going to serve for a year. Therefore they won't encounter the legislature. That's fine. But then two people down, that institutional knowledge goes away and there's maybe a whole new crop of people, legislators who come after them with this kind of legislation and with term limits, those legislators eventually will not have the institutional memory to to remember that they did it. So are we doomed to just repeat this hysterical cycle every two years of screaming to the heavens and then having, you know, people. We we do that anyway. I mean, we we do that anyway. I mean, book bans are nothing new, right? I mean, they've been been with us for about as long as we've had books, unfortunately. (laughs) To your point about public service, I want to go through the fact that if you're elected on any uh, statewide office does pay a very decent amount of money, that is a full-time job, but any job from state legislature to county commissioner to mayor to city commissioner to school board to park board, none of those jobs pay very well. And none of them, none of them pay in a way that could sustain some a person who needs to work for a living Most, and I, and I would i would argue that it's that. it's i would argue that probably a majority of the legislature and obviously this is going to change and and if you're retired you know but but most of the most of the lawmakers who are still still have an active career which is what we want right i mean i think i mean there's nothing wrong with having some some retirees there but i think sometimes we go too far in that direction i mean for instance when we're debating like child care issues it'd be nice if more of our lawmakers were active parents and and understood what it was like to be a parent in 2023. Um, But I would argue that that a lot of the people who have active careers, they're not making money serving in the legislature. Um, I mean, there's some nice perks. The health insurance is a heck of a perk. Um, You know, the pay is is not small. I mean, the day pays pretty decent, but most of them are taking a financial hit by the time you calculate the amount of time they spend even out of session attending interim committee meetings attending you know the things that aren't very official where you know maybe showing up at a county commission meeting or a city commission meeting interacting with local officials interacting with constituents um that's a tough job the the pay is okay just so everybody knows when at least when i was there and it's probably increased since then i think it was 
Uh, it depends on if you're in session or not, which does make sense. If it's a session year, you're in session for four months from January through April. And I think it was about 22,000 per for that year. But you and some people will say, well, $22,000 isn't an insignificant amount of money. But stop and think about the fact that you are away. And if you're not from the Bismarck Mandan area, you're away from your family. And you're definitely away from your job during full time during the day for four months yeah. out of that year. It's a long period of time. And then when you're not in session and there's a whole year where you're not, I want to say there is a monthly stipend and it was yeah. around $400 a month. So it's just not hand over fist cash. And you right. are, if you're doing it right, you're going to meetings. Right. You're doing a lot of research in those off months. That's and like I don't, the very least worth $400. Yeah. And I, I don't listen. I don't want to start a debate about politician pay. It's such a fraught issue. I remember, remember when Governor Bergham was trying to give back his salary as governor, which, which by the way, I didn't agree with. I didn't want to set a precedent. No, I don't want I, to make yeah, it so that only rich you. people can be elected governor. I want, I want, I want to at least be able to consider somebody being elected governor who needs the governor's salary because they're not a rich person. Um, I, I that needs to remain a possibility. On the other side, I, I but I mean, the pay is beside the point. I want Americans and North Dakotans to start thinking of public service as an honorable thing again, because I think a lot of people, I look at what's been happening in the North Dakota Republican party, where we've been talking about, you know, for, for a long time now, how many of the quote unquote normies or the people who are sort of the traditional Republicans mm -hmm. stop showing up. Um, they're not showing up to their committee. They're, they're not running for district chair. They're not, they don't want to put up with it because it's just, you're getting screamed at in the social media age. It's become, terrible and I, I think they just they're accused you know if you have some of these positions now you're part of the establishment you're an insider you're an elite etc cetera, etc cetera. it's driving good people out of out of those positions and and not just I'm, I'm talking about a political party there i would argue the same that we're probably not getting the best recruits we can for park boards for city commissions which is not me besmirching the people who are there necessarily I'm just saying we're probably not recruiting as good of people as we could be because we have such a low opinion of public service. Because And because of the fervor and because of the way that, yeah, the way that they're being attacked publicly now, it scares people from being involved. I'd argue it scares people from even going to district meetings because they're too worried about being metaphorically tarred and feathered or part of someone who's, you know, if you describe it terribly, is incredibly passionate about things that are, you know, conspiracy theory based yeah. or way to the right or left. And they don't want to sit through an hour and a half of someone preaching to them about it. I actually don't think you can divorce the pay scale from it because when you disregard public service, it becomes politically radioactive to pay them what they're worth. And when you don't pay them what they're worth, good people to your point about like the governor's salary, it can be extended elsewhere. Good people who would otherwise need to be compensated for their time maybe not make it full time but make it worth their while otherwise they just can't afford yeah. the time away and, and to remember their family to pay their mortgage they're going to be discouraged from running and therefore the people who do run are frankly the people that have the time who make this a hobby horse and it food. becomes it becomes a domino effect because a lot of the people who hold the highest you know congressional office governor you look down their resume they usually started on like a school board or something i mean that's where a lot of them get their start when they're a lot yeah. younger and they get they get elected to some lower elected office and then they just moved up the ladder and that's not a bad thing right i think that's a very good thing where you get it's actually, experience it because when they say something or when someone says something dismissive about well the schools can just do this that congressman or someone who's now the state they've actually been in charge say, of a school actually, budget no well, i've done uh, the school budget and right. it's not that easy to exactly do you need to take in the uh, I, take the context into and I, I thought it was really important when i wrote my column that i compared it to military service because again we honor the heck out of our military and we should but it's like i, I think we forget the military what gives the american military and what gives american law enforcement uh what do you, what's the word i want to use I, credibility is the wrong word but what makes them legitimate what makes the powers that they exercise legitimate powers is the fact that they flow from civilian authority. The people who are ultimately in charge of law enforcement, the people who are ultimately in charge of, of, of the military are elected by the people. The pure person at the top of the, of the chain of command in the American military is first the Secretary of Defense and then the President of the United States. 
It's a civilian mm-hmm. leadership. And so I, I think that it's such an important concept. The people who hold elected office, that is the beating heart of our republic. It's not the police. It's not the military. It's the politicians. And I know people don't want to hear that because they have, oh, politicians, gross. But what else What else are we celebrating on the 4th of July if not our right to elect people to represent us? And I think you see uh, just, and there's no way to quantify this, but post-World War II, the, that you know generation of veterans that led to the baby boomer generation, um, there were obviously there are problems with it and problem, you know, there, there were things that need to, we continue to, you know, work with and deal with today. But I think there were a lot of people, especially active military who came home and thought to themselves, you know, I'm, you know, maybe they were glad they did it. Maybe they didn't, but they're like, you know, getting shot at in Italy, Germany, Japan, that sucked. I never want to be part of a country that falls into a fascist regime. I want to get very active with public service as much as I can. And so whether they ran for office or not, they showed up to a district meeting. That was just part and parcel of what you did. They showed up, they, they knew who their elected representatives were. There wasn't this dismissal of um, public service. That there was a very active, um, and there was a lot more emphasis put on the individual person running for that office versus a political party. I uh, retweeted recently as a political report about the number of legislatures that have gone towards being trifectas, a la North Dakota's and Minnesota's, where each uh, chamber, House and Senate, and the governor are part of the same party, and which ones have become super majorities in the past. And now we're up to 29 states versus 21 states like less than eight years ago are supermajority trifectas. So like California is, uh, so Minnesota wouldn't count as a supermajority. They only have one, uh, one, the Democrats only have the Senate by one vote. But in North Dakota, it's lopsided for the Republicans. In California, it's lopsided for the Democrats. There's there's good stories in that article about being, um, there's a, the only Republican in the state Senate in Hawaii, or there's two Republicans in the state Senate in Rhode Island. And it's to the point where you know, people start losing faith. In there's, public there's, 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 four, there's four Democrats in the state Senate in North Dakota. And, in North Dakota. And it's like, what do you do every day? Yeah. What, what, you know, well, what, I, what are, I think that's definitely... No views, and people get more and more divorced from the process. Yeah. They don't feel represented. And then the more tuning out happens, the worse the majority gets. So I don't know what the solution is because your domino effect analysis, I think, is spot on. I And, and I, I think what you're talking about, too, is, is, is a part of the problem in that for instance, again, what's happening at the North Dakota Republican Party, where you have a new regime that's in charge of the party, and they're very much about wanting to, um, they're very much about wanting to enforce ideological discipline, right? They keep talking about that. We, you know, we want to enforce uh, fidelity to the platform. I forget the way they say it, but that's essentially what they want. And so, I, I think to me, that connotation of public service is you're you're about serving the needs of the party rather than serving your constituents. And I don't want to elect people who feel that way to office. I want to elect people who say, okay, I ran as a Republican or I ran as a Democrat because that's representative of how I view the world. Like I, I, I'm generally limited government or I, whatever it is. But once you're elected, you have an obligation to serve all of your constituents who in every election, they're not uniform. They're not uniform partisan and even within a a partisan block they're not uniform ideologically you have to serve everybody that to me is public service but where we're heading is is you know if you're a republican you have to vote in lockstep with every other republican i don't i think that's a that would be a poor way to run a park board let away a country it would and it's going to be up to those elected officials too to explain themselves and to educate the populace about one what they do to why they should be there and why there, there shouldn't, we shouldn't be giving into the hysterics of either, you know, the far reaches of the bases of either political party or people who just don't, don't bother to talk to the people that will be directly impacted by legislation they want passed before they try and pass it. And that is going to mean the legislature getting out and talking to more people. And it is going to have to mean voters stepping up and finding out who their legislators are. And I, well, that, well that's part of it too, it, though, is, is part of it, a lot of this comes from the voters. A lot of this is, is, is what voters, or at least the voters who are showing up, the people who are showing up to party meetings, who are showing up in the candidate selection process, who are showing up on election day, a lot of them, right and left, want this. 
you know, I'm they not do. not all, yeah. but I mean, they, they want this, and that's that's one of the confounding things. This isn't really a, a top down problem. This is a bottom up problem. And there are sitting legislators that get very frustrated, and I understand it as a former one. When people, when potential voters say, "Well, they're so secretive; they exist in the smoky back room. We can't ever no, contact them," and they're and they're screaming to the heavens, like, "Hey, if you Google search my name and North Dakota, the first thing that pops is my legislative page that has my home address, my cell phone number, and my email address on it." Which, by the way, don't don't, don't abuse those like things. Which, by the way, don't abuse those. If I can just do a little PSA, don't abuse those things. We are so lucky that our lawmakers are that open, and a lot of places. You know, you call, you call, you try to call your local state lawmaker and you're going to talk to some staffer or a flunky or a voicemail or something. I've called some of those cell numbers to get comment from a lawmaker and I, you know, they're out on a tractor in the middle of a field somewhere. I mean, it's literally their cell phone. Well, and uh, just to you know, kind of the darker side of this too, uh, I, I don't have personal experience with this. I'm a, you know, uh, uh, I was a young male running for office and I went out door knocking by myself in the dark, wherever neighborhood. I had my home address on my legislative page. You can find it. But I knew women, especially younger women, that got a P.O. box as their mailing address because they had yeah. people try to follow them home. They had people try and contact them in ways that were uh, not appropriate to describe it in a G-rated way. And people need to understand when you're putting yourself out there to run for public service, you're really putting yourself out there. And there are those, frankly, usually younger women who experience things like that and then have to protect themselves by getting things like P.O. boxes. I yeah. just, my point is none of this is free. None of it's easy. When you step up to run, whether you agree with that person or not, there are things that person is doing and going through that you're maybe not thinking about when it comes to public service. Like also, that. I mean, I, they're, they're human beings and deserve to be treated with dignity but you look at something like the like the fufang controversy up in grand forks and i was on the side very much where i thought that project was problematic and it proved out to be true once the air force got around or the military got around to telling us um you know how they felt about it it turned out to be real but, objections that were real they were, they were threatened with citizens arrest by people coming to the city right. council i mean, now, I is mean that absurd I, yes but you know what in the back of their heads they're going could I actually get arrested for this? Is right. this worth it? Should I be doing it? Or this? even even beyond that. I mean, they were insulted. They were stalked on social media, their businesses, you know, because a lot of them, I mean, very few public offices in North Dakota are full-time positions. So these people have day jobs, you know, and they're trying to and go kids, about their day jobs. They have children who go to yeah. schools. And I mean, and, and now they feel unsafe or now they feel like they're putting their, their, their livelihoods at, at stake. And, and I guess, again, if, if that is how we're going to treat public servants, if we're just going to treat them all immediately like they're all corrupt and they're all out to get us or, or whatever, who's going to be left to serve in those offices? That, there was a great John Adams quote, and he wrote this in a letter to his son, uh, who was, um, who was a, uh, a student at Harvard at the time. And he said that public business must always be done by somebody. And it will be done by somebody or other. If wise men decline it, others will not. If honest men refuse it, others will not. Um, and I mean, that's that's it. I mean, if we if we reach mm -hmm. a point to where successful, honest, diligent, scrupulous people don't feel safe, whether it's for personal threat or or threat to their reputation or threat to their livelihood, if they don't feel safe seeking public office, who is left? that's going to seek these offices and people with hysterical and frankly, eventually fascist leanings can be put there if, if not put in place again, it, and it's degrees to everything. It's like what I was saying about the grand fork city, uh, commissioner council. I can't remember which they have, but when someone says I'm putting you under citizens arrest and they're like, yeah. well, that's silliness, but it's like, it goes back and forth. It's like, but it creates this gray space where you're like, well, how serious is that? How, how far can that go? And it turns out that didn't go all the way there. But like, when's it going to start boiling over? When's this going to get bad, bad? Count your blessings and understand that you have access to cool things like a public library. Understand that people who run for office are, for the vast majority of the time, doing it out of the goodness of their heart, even if they don't, uh, you know, they're doing it from a give back perspective to their community even if they don't go about it the way that you would go about it and then go and express that to them. They don't deserve, they don't automatically deserve your vote. I'm sure as heck not saying that. And they don't automatically deserve 
uh, your support or even you agree no, with but the, them. But there's ways the to time. disagree they with them. They deserve your respect. Well, our, our system has plenty of opportunities to stand up and respectfully disagree, to stand up and, and even passionately disagree, and also opportunities to challenge them and say, I don't think you should be in this office anymore. I think it's so bad I'm going to recall you. I think it's so bad I'm going to challenge you for the party's nomination or I'm going to challenge you on the general election ballot. All of those things are valid. They should be challenged. They, you know, their, their ideas, it's a marketplace of ideas. Their ideas should be put to the test. What I'm saying is, is that we've got to treat, if we, if we, if we stop treating, when we have in many ways, treating the democratic process and elected office with the dignity that it deserves, we're forgetting that that sort of service is at the center of our society. You know, and one one other piece I will say of this is it's going to take the people running for office stepping up and getting away from a very easy narrative that's uh, easy to run with, too. And it's not and I can't pretend I was up always above this either. You could probably point the finger at me. I don't know specifically where, but there's a narrative when you run for federal office, you run against D.C., right? The You know, the you know, fill in your swear words here out at out in the District of Columbia that don't represent us. They're the scum of the earth. Now elect me to go be the one clean one out there out of, you know, 143 members or one out of 100 senators. And there's an easy way of even doing that, even running for local office, that you don't want to just be another politician. But the, the sliding scale there is you're calling everybody else who's in office right now a scumbag instead and now, of saying and what you're going to do. And now you're going to go cut deals? Because I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, at the end of the day, cutting deals – Right. Um, negotiating, yeah. compromising. That's the job. Nobody gets to go and just impose their will on the process. We don't have dictators in the Republic. So anyway, we'll put a pin in it there. I, I hope my, my column was let's honor political service like we honor military service. Um, if you want to check that out. Um, thanks for listening. And uh, by the way, I should say that coming up on Friday, got a couple of interesting guests. Uh, we've heard a lot about um, the North Dakota's universities being challenged by a, a new Minnesota law uh, that's that's opening the door to some free tuition, some free attendance for qualifying Minnesota residents. There's a lot of concern on on this side, the west side of the Red River, that that's going to have a serious impact on a lot of enrollment at some of our universities because there are a lot of kids from Minnesota who come over to North Dakota to go to school. I would argue that's a good thing. What are we going to do about it? NDSU President David Cook's going to be joining Chad Oban and I on Friday to talk about that. Also, um, Christopher Dodson, longtime lobbyist for the North Dakota Catholic Conference, just announced his retirement. Going to have him on. Obviously, there's been some momentous changes in his sphere of public policy. We'll talk with him about that coming up on Friday. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk again. Did you know Forum Communications Company has a robust podcast library? At inforum.com forward slash podcasts, we have everything from politics, sports, true crime, outdoor adventure, and more. Visit inforum.com forward slash podcasts and explore them all today.